stretching for almost 2,000 miles from coast to coast, through cities, across canyons, through deserts and rivers, the U.S.-Mexico border is as diverse as it is vast. For generations, culture, tradition, and people have crossed this border, many in pursuit of the American dream. But others have also tried to cross. We are going to get the bad ones out, the criminals and the drug deals. We are going to get them out, and we're going to get them out fast. Recently, we've witnessed a new drive to strengthen the border between these two countries. A call to build a wall. But this wall has divided families and divided opinion throughout the world. With over 350 million legal crossings every year, the US-Mexico border is the busiest land border on Earth. Over 750 miles of barrier already exist. Impenetrable steel fences, walls, and barbed wire. Most of these are recent additions to this landscape. If you talked to somebody in the 60s, 70s, or 80s and said, well, someday they'll just you know, build a wall across this, they would have thought you were crazy. President Trump is determined to extend the wall along the length of the border with Mexico to keep out hundreds of thousands who cross into America illegally every year. America is being invaded. And I've had a lot of people, oh, well, you're racist, you don't like Mexican. What don't you understand about illegal? It is illegal to cross the fence and come in to the United States. Stretching from the Pacific Ocean in the west to the Gulf of Mexico in the east, the wall, if it's built, will be one of the biggest structures of its kind. What a huge undertaking that is and what a huge step forward in stopping the flow of criminals and, and drugs from flowing over our southern border. I think everything that he does, he's making America great again. The wall is not going to solve the problem. They'll climb over, they'll go under, they'll go around it. And you're just going to throw money away. Money that you could use to help people that are really in need here in this country. I will build the greatest wall you've ever seen. It will be a beautiful wall. It will be a big wall. It will be a wall that is impenetrable. The border wall has had a real effect on the American psyche. It has created a climate of fear and anxiety among the American public. I'm very hurt at what's going on in America. And now we're trying to build walls. And that's just not the America I know. Some of the dangers that agents face on a day-to-day -day basis is bandits uh, or smugglers assaulting them, uh, fighting them physically, or throwing rocks, bottles. And of course, walls have made a huge difference. The Trump administration has put an unprecedented emphasis on border enforcement, border militarization. Customs and Border Patrol is composed of 60,000 agents. 16,000 are stationed on the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, and it is the largest law enforcement agency in the U.S. government at this time. We've been shot at. Some of my coworkers have been murdered uh, patrolling the border. It's not easy uh, and it's dangerous, but we're, we do it proudly and, 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 and we're here uh, to serve America. The current boundary between the U.S. and Mexico was first drawn in 1848, following the U.S.-Mexico War. Mexico lost half of its territory as officials drew a line from the Pacific Ocean in the west to the Gulf of Mexico in the east. What started as a border marked by boulder and fence posts has been transformed. 
Over the last 30 years, it has changed beyond all recognition. In my childhood, there was just a couple of strands of barbed wire. There was no wall of any kind. People, old timers there tell me, they remember dragging their bike across into Tijuana, riding around for the afternoon, grabbing a few tacos, coming back to San Diego at the end of the day. So it's really only in the 90s that the notion that location should be somehow impenetrable it literally would not have made sense to people that a wall should be constructed across this space. This beautiful beach in Tijuana is a place of pleasure and pain. Called Friendship Park, separated families gather here at the wall to spend time with their loved ones on the other side. For many of these families, their lives spanning this territory pre-existed the creation of the U.S.-Mexico border. And so at that park, you see all of this played out. You see them committed to uh, maintaining those ties. Uh, grandparents meeting their newborn grandchildren for the first time through the fence. I've seen people make out through that fence because they can't keep their hands off each other. They're so desperate to be with each other. I've seen people say goodbye to dying loved ones at that fence, final farewells. You know, those are the fundamentals of Mexican culture, and you see those played out every day uh, at Friendship Park, where families are working hard to, to stay together. Yo siempre, desde chico, siempre soñaba con tener una vida buena. A mi edad, lo que más uno siempre deseaba era unos tenis americanos. Entonces, yo siempre pensaba que la única manera de poder lograr algo así iba a ser yendo a donde estaba todo eso. Gaston Casares, like millions of others, followed his American dream and arrived in the U.S. when he was 16. He followed in the footsteps of generations of Mexicans before him. Migrants without the necessary paperwork who crossed the border in search of work. ¿Cómo es que la gente se iba? Era más común cruzar ilegalmente que solicitar un permiso. Entonces, este, yo pensaba que solicitar un permiso era para gente de dinero y nunca hice nada por solicitar un permiso. Llegué sin papeles. Throughout the 20th century, you had Southwestern farmers and other industries uh, demanding that the Border Patrol step down, demanding that the Border Patrol not heavily enforce the U.S. immigration laws so that they could have cheap, uh, or easy access to cheap Mexican labor. A very different welcome awaits the migrants making the journey today. When Gaston arrived in 1986, he quickly found work and became one of the 11 million undocumented migrants in the US. He married fellow Mexican Aime and together raised a family in San Diego. Teníamos ideas muy similares. Este, los dos habíamos emigrado con ideas que nos este que teníamos en común. Trabajar, este, vivir mejor y ayudar a nuestras familias. Yo no quería que me dieran, solamente que quería la oportunidad de estar donde podía trabajar y, y vivir dignamente. After 30 years living in the U.S., Gaston discovered that he would be deported to Mexico, a country he no longer considered home. Gaston is one of the victims of President Trump's pledge to deport all illegal immigrants. Al principio lo más aterrador era separarse de la familia. Siempre lo más lo que más me aterraba era ser separado de la familia. He's He's so positive and I know he does it for us, but he's very Oh, he's just such a good person. And Incredible dad, it's just, he's just so, he brings me strength and he, he gives me confidence that we're gonna be okay. 
a la hora de que yo tenía que entrar al edificio, yo no quería despedirme. Sentía que era de mala suerte. Este... Pero ya Jaira no, no aguanto. Ya Jaira me abrazó y estaba muy... Y Jaira siempre fue la más fuerte. Siempre más fuerte que mi esposa, que Iván, que yo. Siempre era ahí la que estaba. Decía, todo va a estar bien, papá. Todo va a estar bien. Pero ese día no. I was so worried about Gaston because he was here for his entire life. I mean, he was almost 30 years. It's our country. We know the language, but we didn't live there for so many years. So I was so scared. I was so worried for him. And, and I just think, okay, I'm gonna do it. So the next day I get up, I take the kids to school and I went to work. I was crying the entire day, but I was happy to do it. Separating Gaston in Tijuana and his family in San Diego is the San Isidro border crossing. It's the busiest border crossing in the world, with more than 50 million crossings between the two cities every year. We currently spend about $20 billion a year on border security. The amount of money that is spent on immigration law enforcement is actually larger than the amount of money that we spend on all of our policing and national security agencies combined. Since the terrorist attacks on 9-11, the U.S. started to lock down their borders. Customs and Border Patrol agents here are always on the lookout for suspicious activity. They could hide narcotics in any part of the vehicle. Tires, gas tanks, dashes, quarter panels. Any space in the vehicle that they could stuff something in, they would do it. They could also build special compartments in vehicles to hide drugs or people. The border between San Diego and Tijuana sees the highest level of illegal activity. We really want you to have the appropriate documents. That's more efficient for you to travel. If you don't, you're probably going to end up getting referred for secondary inspection until we can validate that you are a U.S. citizen and that you actually deserve to be coming to the United States. Iván, ¿puedes poner la mesa? Born in America, Yahaira and her brother Ivan have full U.S. citizenship, but the immigration policies have had a profound effect on the whole family. I think it's important to take care of each other. I'm very lucky that we're in a very tight-knit family, but it takes so much time to even be okay with the situation. You're never going to be okay with it, but to cope, because I went through stages of anger where I was really angry. And I have days where I'm still angry. And I have days where I just feel like crying. And I think the most important thing is to take the time to just feel it. Marilyn, breakfast. I feel scared because my kids need me. They're still young and they need me here. I really want to be there with him, but at the same time, I need to be here. Hopefully, I can get my documents and do both, go back and forth there and here. But until that moment, I, I, I'm scared. I'm really scared. And I never feel that feeling in 27 years until last year and to now. La más pesada. 
Aimé, like Gaston, is undocumented. She lives in fear of being detained by the authorities and sent back to Mexico. Her fears are made worse because Ivan has autism. All these problems, I'm like having school, just starting to daydream about like my dad and like what, what might happen. Yeah, but now I know I can always like see my dad every Sunday. And soon, hopefully, I want to take my dad to see Avengers Infinity War. <laughs> yeah. Family friend Marilyn Stober opened her home to the family and has supported Gaston, Aimee and the children for over 10 years. She has seen firsthand the effect of separation. Bye. They have ripped the family apart. That's just crazy to me. We complain so much about fathers not being present. And then we have actually ripped the father, wage earner, out of this family. Yaida is 17 and wants to go to college. And for Ivan, who's a growing 15-year-old autistic boy, he needs his dad just really desperately. Bye, have fun. Gaston, he has never, ever done anything wrong, not even a parking ticket. And now Aimee is afraid of everything. It's really hard because she can be pulled from the family at any time and then those kids would be, you know, alone, basically. The Trump administration has generated an unprecedented change in the nation's immigration policies. You see a major phase shift, a major turnaround from this talking point. He's one of the first presidents to say that immigration isn't necessarily a good thing. President Trump has highlighted the risk to the U.S. posed by drug cartels, people smugglers, and criminals. But the majority of illegal immigrants are people fleeing civil unrest in Central America. Yes, of course. We subimos the train. Al inicio, da mucho miedo. O sea, todo el trayecto del camino va con miedo uno del tren. Ahí va viendo así por la vía del tren. Las cruces donde la gente se ha muerto, se ha quedado, les ha cortado el pie, se han muerto, pues y eso. Despite the dangers, Tijuana has become a magnet for people trying to get into the U.S. illegally. This is Mexico's second city and one of the murder capitals of the world. Drug cartels and people smugglers are quick to take advantage of Tijuana's new arrivals. But there are others who reach out to the migrants. The vast majority are not criminals, they're not drug runners. They're moms and dads who want to take care of their families. When you get here, you're depressed, you're sad. Some guys say, I'm going to cross again tomorrow. And then after three or four days, the reality hits you that, well, it's not going to be easy. Over the past 20 years, the gang warfare that's occurring, especially in Mexico, has generated this image of violence along the border. But juxtaposed with this image of uh, violence and conflict is another image, uh, one of cooperation and community. And it's an image that does not get talked about in, in the media or in popular culture, probably because it's just not as exciting or sexy, right, as, as a film about violence and conflict. But that story about cooperation and community is integral to the history of the border. Since Casa del Migrante Shelter opened its doors in 1987, it has helped over a quarter of a million migrants arriving in Tijuana, offering them practical and emotional support while they decide on their next step. Entonces, llegando a las casas de albergue, uno sí se restablece la confianza de, 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 de la gente y eso. 
porque ya hay de distintos países, se relacionan, este, a veces que uno comparte el alimento, así, esas cosas, y se hace muy hermanable en las casas de albergue. Benjamin was forced to leave his home in Nicaragua in search of work, leaving behind his wife and three young children. Que quiero pedir asilo para ver cómo mantengo a mi familia pues en un estado mejor. O sea, casi no no puedo hablar de eso porque mucho me me duele pues verlos dejado. comenté nada, solo que me fui a trabajar y eso. You know, I really never get down because there's a lot of sad stories, but then there's also good stories, you know. Uh, just a simple thing, people, when they're leaving, they'll shake your hand and say, thank you, you really helped me, I thought my life was over. Benjamin had come to Tijuana planning to cross illegally, but has decided it's too dangerous. Still determined to realize his American dream, he'll find another way. In 2017, prototypes of President Trump's promised wall were built. A wall that would be imposing and impossible to climb. It would embody the idea of making America great again. Southeast of San Diego, vigilante Bob Maupin is getting ready to patrol his backyard for migrants entering the US illegally. Okay, we're ready to roll. Until the wall is built, Bob is taking matters into his own hands. Up along that ridge, on top of those rocks, that's where the cartel spotters are. And sometimes, this time of the evening, you can see reflection off of their binoculars. They're getting better, though. I've never been in the military, but even at my age, I can run for 200 yards, drop down behind a tree, and, and hit a three-inch target 200 yards away. So I keep practicing. Bob has built his own two-mile-long, 10-foot-tall fence next to the border wall for extra protection. I built this fence to slow them down. It's not gonna stop anybody, but the more you slow them down, the easier they are to catch. And every once in a while, we find clothing in the razor wire. The last thing that I found was a backpack. It's what's left of it is in the yard. Uh, the dogs play with it. And they've taken everything out of it and pretty much torn it up. But uh, those are things that, you know, my dogs play with. The first attempt to stop illegal immigration near the San Diego-Tijuana border was introduced in 1994. Operation Gatekeeper meant tougher security at border crossings. So migrants looked for more remote stretches for opportunities to cross. Bob saw a sharp increase in migrants roaming his lands. That is when we used to pick up anywhere from 30 to over 100 a night coming up through these trees. I consider it my job to stop anybody coming across the property. If I encounter uh, armed people, I will take them on. I feel it's my duty as an American to protect my country. A wall already exists along almost 750 miles of the U.S.-Mexico border.
but President Trump plans to extend the wall along the 2,000-mile frontier. The announcement provoked strong emotions on both sides. Others have found a different way to oppose the wall. Pusimos la escalera. Lo primero que nos dijo el de inmigración es: no lo vamos a dejar pintar de este lado. Pinte nada más del lado mexicano. Entonces, realmente estamos pintando y siempre he dicho del lado que se necesita pintar. El muro es de Estados Unidos. En México no ocupamos ese muro. Entonces, es el lado que queríamos quitarlo. Renowned artist Enrique Chu has embarked on an ambitious bicommunal project to create the largest mural in the world. Unir el corazón de la, de la frontera de las dos naciones en este proyecto. Nosotros estamos usando como un lienzo más, como una forma de expresarnos. Para mí, este proyecto representa uh, la forma de vivir en la frontera. Este, para llegar a ser un artista internacional y haber trascendido este, fronteras, es algo súper bonito para mí. Enrique significa una parte muy importante en lo que es nuestra comunidad eh, este, cultural. He also has a personal connection with this border. Y que lo puedo decir por experiencia, a los ocho años cruzamos por el cerro con mi mamá. Entonces, claro que sé lo que siente cruzar legal e ilegalmente por, por Estados Unidos. Y a la fecha trato de mantener ese, esa, ese sueño, esa idea como una una anécdota más para seguir pintando, por eso hago esas cosas en la frontera. No puedo parar, tengo una emoción cada mañana de poderme levantar y, y continuar haciendo un proyecto. Porque mi idea es lograr que el arte o con el arte poder cambiar el mundo. As children of Mexican immigrants, Yahaira and Ivan feel a strong connection with both countries. Today, they are making their weekly journey to meet their father across the border in Tijuana. I'm very proud of them. Even that everything changed and things are getting really bad, I want them to be good citizens and proud to be Americans and do well. Even if the situation changed completely for us, they have to keep going. Se nos olvida todo, todo lo negativo. Todo se vuelve felicidad en ese momento. Los muros dividen la tierra, pero no creo que sean lo suficiente poderosos para dividir a los seres humanos. So that's border patrol. So they're looking for footprints or anything to track people down. So um yeah, they look through the beach. There are people standing there. So they're always, always there, always checking. This is the area where I crossed my first time when I was 16 years old. Till now, I don't, I don't know how to swim. Still. Yeah, he doesn't know how to yeah, swim. Yeah, <laughs> I was swim. trying to teach yeah. him how to swim. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, this is this. This is exactly where I crossed my first time. When Gaston crossed, there was no ocean wall on this beach. The first fences went up here in 1994, and since then have continued to be reinforced. Nowadays, under 24-hour surveillance, the border control agents watch every move. It's so insane to me that it's right there, that my home is right there. I was raised over there because I have a piece of paper. I can come back and forth and the piece of paper is what separates my parents. I want to make sure that all of their sacrifices were for something and do whatever I can to bring our stories out there and to help my community because I think 
for a long time, um, my parents have been labeled so many different horrible things that um, I hope to erase by contributing. She made me cry. <laughs> She's my daughter. With increased security at the urban border crossings, over the last three decades, migrants have been forced to find different routes to get to the other side. East of San Diego along the border is Arizona. More than half of America's existing border barriers stand along Arizona's vast desert boundary with Sonora, Mexico. This hostile environment is the front line of America's war on drugs and a common route for drug and human traffickers. Brennan was a go-getter, he was a happy child, and he knew very early on that he wanted to be a police officer, that that's what he wanted to do in life. It was Mother's Day the day before, and so he had spent most of the day with me and went on duty. He had a call, so he left, and he said, I'll be back for dessert. Brandon Mendoza was a promising young officer with the Mesa Police Department in Phoenix, Arizona. In May 2014, his mother's world changed forever. At quarter of three in the morning, I was woke up from a phone call from a fellow police officer, and it was the Mesa Police Department, and they took me down to the hospital, and um, about a half hour after I got there, he passed away in surgery. His injuries were just so bad. It was a huge loss, you know, that he was gone, and it was a difficult time of my life. Brandon Mendoza had just finished his shift when he was killed in a head-on road collision with an illegal immigrant who had three times the legal limit of alcohol in his blood and was high on meth. I am not against people coming to our country, and I understand their lives and why they would be pushed to come here illegally to get to a better life, I understand that. My fight is against the illegal alien criminals and the people who repeatedly come over our border committing crimes against Americans, killing them, raping them, the drug mules that come over our border and bring drugs into this country. This is where I feel that our country has failed us as American citizens. Mary Ann has set up a campaign group with other families who have lost loved ones to illegal immigrants. One of their biggest supporters is President Trump. President Trump's message resonates with the American people because he's not politically correct. He says it like it is. He's a breath of fresh air because I think everything that he does, he's making sure that Americans are first, making America great again. Unfortunately, I think the Trump administration continues to depict the border and undocumented and legal Mexican Im immigrants as a threat. And as a result of that, it has created a climate of fear and anxiety among the American public. And I do think that the Trump administration is using this language about the wall and border enforcement to galvanize support. I was invited to the inauguration and I was invited when he spoke at Department of Homeland Security and signed the executive orders for the wall. A physical barrier is going to stop um, repeat criminals from coming back over the border. It's going to stop the drug flow, um, the human trafficking, all of these types of things. A recent study showed that the violence that's occurring in Mexico doesn't spill over into the United States. All of the border cities, right, from California to Texas, on the U.S. side, they are some of the safest cities in the nation. They don't end up on this annual list of uh, America's 60 most dangerous cities. 
A lot of the murders in the United States are committed by U.S. citizens, and this uh, 2017 study also found that a border wall wouldn't necessarily help. My personal view on the wall is that walls don't work. Uh, Janet Napolitano has famously said, show me a 50-foot wall and I'll show you a 51-foot ladder. If any of these politicians trying to stop it from happening was affected by illegal alien crime as I was, if any one of their children had been killed by an illegal criminal, they would be singing a completely different tune and they would be wanting exactly what I'm wanting. With the hardening of the borders and attitudes towards migrants, numbers of illegal crossings are down. But still, many thousands of desperate people venture into this unforgiving environment in their search for a better life. The volunteers of Humane Borders maintain a network of water stations in the Sonoran Desert on routes used by migrants. 320. Okay. Cheers. Tastes fine to me. This is a treacherous journey. Your chances of making it are not good. You could be picked up, you could die. What that tells me is how desperate these folks are that they're willing to take those chances to get up here. You come out here and you can actually help someone, you know, survive you know, because uh, thousands of people have died out here. El 17 de, de agosto 2013, él había cruzado el desierto. Pues nunca pensé que, que mi hijo, que nunca lo crucé por peligros, él fuera a meterse a un lugar así. After his marriage broke down, Camerina's son, Marco, left Mexico in an attempt to join his mother in the U.S. I was in the desert with two muchachos. So from there, I was preocupé demasiado, ¿no? Marco tried to cross at the height of summer when temperatures in the desert can reach over 50 degrees Celsius. People rarely have the essential equipment to survive such extreme conditions. When I see items like this, and both of these are fairly recent, um, it tells me that we're not too far behind the person that has been walking. Um, this makes this real, that this is a real human being walking across the desert, carrying what little they can on their backs and on their person to get it this far. And they still have a long ways to go. Um, but this is uh, very recent. It even smells <laughs> fairly recent. It doesn't smell uh, old and dirty at all. For me, it makes it a real human journey. They're not a subspecies. They're not an animal. These are humans. Humane borders are showing compassion, but not everybody supports their mission. We did put locks on the barrels about a year and a half ago because people were pouring turpentine and gasoline into the water, vigilante types. Uh, they sometimes shoot holes in the barrels, stab the barrels, and steal the barrels. So a lot of what we do is to fix things in the wake of their vandalism. Camerina has heard nothing from her son in five years. No sé si lo mataron. Se murió de sed. Le picó un animal. Yo no sé. Tengo mucha incertidumbre. Y son los cinco años más largos de toda mi vida. Que siento que es una pesadilla. Claro que sí. Como madre, la esperanza más grande que tengo es encontrarlo vivo. 
Arizona officials record the highest number of border deaths, then Texas, then California, then New Mexico. In effect, that Arizona border has become a graveyard for undocumented immigrants. It is estimated that 1,500 people die here every year, but the real figure is likely to be much higher. Humane Borders volunteers frequently come across dead bodies. University of California did a study to see how long it takes for a body to completely disappear from this area. What they did was to wrap the bodies of dead pigs in migrant clothing um, and see how long before there was no trace. Four to seven days. So um, when you think about that, most of the activists that I've talked to here about this issue think that the actual number of deaths is as much as 10 times as that that's actually reported. Camerina's search for her son continues. Bailábamos juntos, cantábamos, hacíamos comida juntos. Él era risueño, era alegre, era bien alegre. Siempre traía pura risa, pura risa. Porque te quiero más que mis ojos, porque mis ojos te vieron. <laughs> y esa canción le canta. My main responsibility are the rural areas here in Santa Cruz County. We have about 1,200 square miles and 50 miles of border with Mexico. I have been here for over 50 years, and I was born right across this fence here, a couple of blocks away from immigrated when I was a young kid. And I've seen the, the dynamics and the evolution of this border. As I was growing up, people would freely come back and forth, okay? There were no restrictions, the walls always been there, the fence has been there, but it was symbolic. It just told you this is where you're at. When I was growing up, people could come and go at leisure. There were no issues. Uh, and now it's gotten to be really difficult and really problematic. Jorge Lopez travels three hours every month to see his family through the fence. With a permit to work in the U.S., he won't risk going home to Mexico for fear of not being allowed back into the U.S. There's a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions, because uh, being without my brothers, being without my dad, uh, the fact that I can be around them every single day, I have and hugged my dad, and it's uh, seven years, eight years that I can I haven't hugged my brothers, and it's it's hard. It's really hard. Like a month ago, his sister-in-law passed away. Uh, his sister is getting married today, and he's not gonna be able to be there for the fact of this border, for the fact that a wall is dividing us as a family. No más este pedacito de alambre nos separa para podernos dar un abrazo, estas barras. No podemos. De estos fierros. Aquí me ha tocado reír con ellos, llorar con ellos. Y pues es duro, es duro venir aquí. He 
it hurts because uh it's it's not a, it's not what i want it's not what i came over here and and just to feel my dad's uh fingertips is it's it's hard I think it's the worst kind of scenario that you can probably present when you can't have families be together, be able to embrace and socialize, and have a wall or a fence that divides them. It just doesn't seem like the humane way to deal with families. It's just a border. Uh, hopes and dreams that are bigger than, than just a wall, dividing uh, two lands. It saddens every all of us to be able to see that, that they can't go across uh, and, and hug each other and socialize with each other uh, because this wall is preventing all of this. There seems to be little hope for people like Jorge and Sergio that things will change. For the millions of people who live in the shadow of this wall, they face an uncertain, divisive time. It's a very comforting notion that you could wall off, uh, you know, people who are different from yourself. It's a, a very human thing to do, unfortunately. Uh, the worst of us, the worst of us. Que la gente voltea a ver nuestra frontera como un, no como una zona de violencia, no como una zona de guerra, no como una zona de, 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 ra, de racismo, a tener una imagen diferente sobre la cultura en México. Y para eso estamos uh, peleando y luchando todos los días y, y trabajando todos los días. We, up to now, have not had the means to communicate our sides of the story. And I think my generation specifically, because we're kids of immigrants and we know, we have all the rights of a, an American citizen, we are not going to tell our stories for what they really are. These communities along the border that have had relationships for over a hundred years will continue to resist the construction of walls and borders, and they'll continue to find ways to be connected economically and culturally. They're good people. Uh, let's not dehumanize them. Let's not say that they're marginal or you know anything like that. They're human beings. They have feelings, they have ambitions, they have goals. Uh, just like everybody else. You know, people are staying here because this is the greatest country in the world. They're in a free country and they have opportunities here. And that's the only thing these people want, an opportunity.